Welcome back to DAP Talk TV, the open conversation between the Liquid Apps team and the DAP Network community. I'm here once again with the principal engineer here at Liquid Apps, Nathan Rempel. What's up, man? Thanks for uh, joining me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Just uh, loving that lockdown life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love having you on here because you're able to explain very technical things in a simple, easy to understand way. Uh, it's a talent of yours. The last time we had this conversation, it was kind of leading up to the bridge weekend and we were talking conceptually of like what a cross chain communication bridge would look like or feel like. We had the bridge activation weekend and we had successful token transfers in a decentralized trustless way between uh, the Kylan testnet and the Robston testnet on Ethereum. How, how'd the weekend go in your opinion? I think it went uh, really well. Uh, we learned a lot. Uh, we saw it work uh, in the end, which uh, was fantastic. It was working uh, quite reliably for uh, sort of the early stage of development it was in. Um, and that gave us the confidence to continue developing it. And having that testnet coverage, having uh, all our, uh, you know, all the DSPs on the DAP network um, participate in that uh, test really illustrated um, a lot of the places where we could make technical improvements where we could make the process um, faster, we could make the process more reliable, we could make the process uh, safer for the people using the service and make it cheaper for the uh, DSPs who are uh, providing the service. Um, so after that event, uh, we went on to um, take all those learnings and figure out uh, the, the stages that we could take to implement them. Um, and we're very close to having uh, the, the first sort of very primary set of um, upgrades in place that would make this uh, production ready. And then we can continue to roll out um, additional quality of life improvements or plugins that would make uh, the service uh, easier and easier for people to use in different ways on both the Ethereum and EOSIO networks and any other future networks we add to the service. Everyone was all excited right after the bridge weekend. We put out the demo video. And I think uh, there were some expectations that maybe like a production bridge would launch immediately, like the next day or the next week. And that, that obviously wasn't the case. Um, I, I thought we were pretty clear going into it that this is test nuts and then there was going to be a process after that. So I, I, I know just from following you guys in Slack and hearing you guys on the team calls, like there's been a lot of improvements made between the bridge uh, weekend and and today, like what are some of the uh, improvements that are, have been made to the communication bridge uh, since then? Well, I think I think the first thing I, I'd like to uh, uh, think about is it's interesting how when we had a proof of concept come out, and it's uh, the, sort of the first iteration of how we can realize this technology in sort of a secure way with the tools we've built. And you always have early adopters in any new technology, right? People who are happy to, to jump on the Kickstarter, jump on the earliest release. They're just so excited. They want to be on that bleeding edge. But sometimes that product, um, you know, can work. It can fulfill what people wanted it to, but it's not going to do it the best. And we, we love everybody's excitement, obviously, about the bridge. And we're like, it, it just shows how... Uh, how useful it may be to the community that uh, people want to jump on it so early, grab onto that bleeding edge. Uh, we just hope it doesn't uh, doesn't cut anybody along the way because, as you said, we've made some awesome refinements. Um, so some of the big things is uh, keeping the bridge in sync. Um, previously, uh, that sort of synchronization process had a lot of moving parts. And now after understanding um, how the bridge is, is being used uh, sort of in the real world, in the real network, we've been able to make a lot of optimizations to that that requires uh, fewer steps, a less complicated process, simpler state tracking um, and uh, easier recovery. So all of this means that um, it's just gonna be simpler to deploy and it's gonna run smoother. And it's going to be safer for people to use because the, the state, um, we now have uh, message and receipts are now like tightly coupled as, as pairs in, in the background. And what that means is that uh, users who transmit tokens will know for sure if a receipt comes back that everything's handled correctly. And if anything goes wrong, um, do the vagaries of, uh, you know, blockchain approvals and gas price changes and, um, you know, people putting the correct account names, even for their transfers, uh, there'll be protocols in place, uh, sort of with um, 
uh, the, the common phrase is um, sort of like a, a timeout or a, 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 like a lo timer lock, where then after a certain period of time, users can automatically, without uh, any other external intervention, retrieve, retrieve their funds, correct the mistake, and try again uh, with sort of no loss, loss to them. Um, and then additionally, that the, the DSPs are signing um, transactions in either direction, and that um, that is done in a secure and a, a sort of gas affordable way has also been improved, which uh, greatly improves the security for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. So all of those improvements are much appreciated by the developers out there. Uh, we're recording this on Friday. Yup is in the process still of deploying their bridge, which is going to be the first one in production. So that's exciting that we're going to have, they have like kind of like a DeFi component to what they're doing. So their bridge is kind of, it, it caters to Ethereum uh, users as far as uh, the yield farming and the LP tokens and uh, a Uniswap, but then all of their heavy liftings happening on, on the EOS mainnet. So all of the improvements you mentioned earlier uh, that help make the lives easier for DSPs and for the developers building on the bridges. But how do we make it as simple as possible for uh, like an end user, if I'm an Ethereum user, how do I make it so that they could be doing things on a different network, potentially an EOS IO chain or the EOS mainnet? How do you make it as simple as possible so that they, I guess, don't even realize they're on a different chain? Right. So I think that's where our uh, V account um, technology on the EOS network will prove uh, very useful. Um, we have uh, some people out in the wild uh, using uh, DAP accounts. Quite, uh, quite heavily. And with the um, launch of uh, the ESIO EVM um, by, uh, by Saya Jaffrey, um, there's components in there that can make EOS more user-friendly to Ethereum. And a big part of that would be the, um, the, the, the uh, key recovery mechanism uh, on Ethereum. And so what that means is we could actually have Ethereum key-based uh, DAP accounts or uh, virtual accounts, where now Ethereum users could interact with the EOS network uh, natively, but utilizing their existing Ethereum keys, signing contracts uh, with uh, MetaMask, things that they're familiar with. Um, and that would hopefully help uh, sort of ease the adoption for Ethereum users who want to come onto the, uh, um, you know, uh, EOS ecosystem to, to utilize the, uh, you know, the, the power that the uh, blockchain provides. And those DAP accounts also allow um, people to onboard using uh, Ethereum keys if they wish, but without having to get, um, or EOS keys, but without having to have their own ES, uh, ESIO account as well. So that uh, drastically reduces uh, the cost of onboarding people. As uh, some, may be uh, some may be familiar, you have to you know, purchase an account essentially on EOS. And so with, uh, with DAP accounts, uh, you don't have to, you just uh, can have keys. So we, 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 we envision um, expanding the, that service to include um, EOS keys, Ethereum keys, um, and writing adapters for other sort of um, uh, key mechanisms, uh, signing mechanisms um, in the future as possible. And um, I know some people out in the community are also adding account recovery and key rec uh, recovery services in there as well. So I think um, that would be a big boon for everybody working together in the ecosystem. So what you're saying is um, in previous implementations of Liquid accounts that we've seen, uh, like the demo apps that Liquid apps put out, like the Liquid Chess and the Elemental Battles, you would create a Liquid account with a username and password. And that was better than having to download a wallet, for example. But what you're saying is instead of creating the virtual account with a username and password or like an email or something like that, you would just use your MetaMask wallet and sign with the same signature and the same key that you use with Ethereum. So you wouldn't even really know that you weren't signing an Ethereum transaction. That's it. It's amazing. That's the beauty. So it seems like the theme of today's conversation is just making everyone's lives easier. It's from the end users and how they interact with their wallets, keys, and applications to the developers interacting with these bridge contracts, uh, to the DSPs. So we talked a little bit about some of the things that made the DSPs lives easier, easier with the bridge, but in general, making DSP lives, DSP lives easier is something that we're, we're kind of working on in the background here. So was there any other insight you gained uh, from working on all of these bridges and all of the DSPs? Because this is some of the most in interaction we've had 
uh, with all of these different parties, like very frequent, like every day uh, conversations with these DSPs and the projects like Yup, working towards a bridge deployment. Is there anything, other insights you, you've picked up on or anything you're working on in the background or, or planning to work on that you're able to talk about? Uh, for sure. Um, this, this sort of bridge event has been super useful for us for the amount of feedback we're getting for our products. Uh, we've had some very devout um, sort of advocates uh, who are using our technology to uh, build things. And we love hearing from them and working with them. But this is the first time we've seen such a large, um, you know, engagement in this particular project. And having that, looking at some of the specific technologies that we've developed that are required to operate the bridge versus some of the technologies that we've developed for other use cases. For example, our um, sort of synchronous uh, uh, storage like IPFS, VRAM solutions, where you can have just-in-time storage, that's useful for those cases where you need to store large data sets. But in the case of the bridge, we found that we don't uh, need those synchronous processes. We don't need to have as much heavy lifting. So one of the big optimizations we're looking at is a, a lighter form of DSP, almost a stateless DSP that doesn't require um, as much of the infrastructure, can be deployed uh, more easily, can be deployed more lightly, and leverages uh, the state management of the blockchain more than um, sort of instantaneous state um, subscriptions. And so that'll make it uh, a lot easier to deploy and uh, in fact, um, significantly easier to have a much larger pool of DSPs available for future bridging projects and endeavors. It's exciting. Um, so <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. <laughs> All right, we wanted to keep this one light not too technical. Um, we're going to be doing a follow-up video. We're going to be recording in a couple of days. We're going to do a technical walkthrough of the different components of the bridge and take a really deep dive. We didn't want this one to be technical. Um, one last question. So this past week, Google was announced as an EOS block producer candidate. They're already moving Fantastic. up the ranks. A couple of block producers have, uh, or not block producers, a couple of proxies have already voted them in, some of the largest ones. I, I, I'm not sure if they're in a paid position, but they're very close. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on that, for some, seeing some big players coming into the ecosystem, not just EOS, but just blockchain as a whole, just getting more serious? I, I think it's extremely exciting. Uh, I, think it, I think Google is, you know, it's, it's almost funny. Uh, blockchain has been kind of this niche world for so long where we have brilliant people doing sort of essentially, you know, kind of like your, your, your garage inventor type backyard uh, type of thing. And, you know, that's, that's kind of a crude, crude way to say it because there's a lot of brilliant, brilliant people building very interesting um, architecture. But these are still small teams. These are still sort of independent people or, um, you know, sort of uh, niche industries that are getting on board. And now we have companies that have literally built the world, the infrastructure that runs the world um, is setting sort of the benchmarks of, you know, uh, automation of data analysis of serverless architecture um, coming into the fray. And this is only a good thing for everybody because th that means the technology itself now, and it's open source technology, and these are people who contribute uh, to open source in huge ways, um, Angular, Firestore. And now imagine, you know, the Firestore of blockchain um, and all the ways that can start connecting blockchains together, all the ways that, you know, if Google starts and Facebook and these companies, and like we heard Libercoin with Facebook, but if people jump on sort of the decentralized projects, don't try to control them, but still get to chuck you know, tens to hundreds of some of the best engineering minds in the world at it, we can only get better. And that can only make more tools available for everybody else to use. Having EOS on BigQuery um, could be a huge boon to DAP development. It's a huge resource um, for analytics. Um, people could start using machine learning algorithms for like doing DeFi trades and arbitrage uh, and whatever they want. Uh, from a financial perspective, but they could start using these machine learning algorithms to inter interact with blockchains in all sorts of exciting ways around UBI identity and anything that we can imagine. It's an exciting time and I'm glad Google's jumping in the space.